From Interfaith Alliance, this is The State of Belief. I'm Interfaith Alliance President Reverend Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch in Long Island. A recent NPR poll shows that 71% of Americans have not heard of or have no opinion about Kamala Harris's pick for her vice president. But we're about to find out a whole lot more. Last week on the show, E.J. Dion credited Tim Walz for amping up Democrats' messaging. And this week, I'll be talking with Najiba Saeed, who has worked with the governor and the first lady of Minnesota on interfaith relations. With the Democratic Party coalescing around Kamala Harris as the nominee, author and commentator Rabbi Jay Michelson joins me this hour to share his perspectives on why he is breathing a sigh of relief with the selection of Walls instead of the Jewish candidate, Josh Shapiro. In the past couple of years, I've had the privilege of conducting so many memorable interviews with some of the great thinkers, strategists, and leaders of our time on the state of belief. They have given you and me so much encouragement for these difficult times, and it's also a way to feel less alone. So I want to make sure you're subscribed to the State of Belief podcast at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform, or visit stateofbelief.com slash subscribe. That way you'll never miss a conversation, and you'll have access to almost 100 past interviews with guests like Dr. Anathea Butler, Jeff Charlotte, Bishop William Barber, Rabbi Sharon Browse, Dr. Jamar Tisby, Rob Reiner, and many, many others. It would really help us to have you subscribe, rate, and tell people you're close to about all you're hearing. The State of Belief is made possible in great part by the generous support of our listeners. If you've made a donation, thank you. You're helping get these conversations heard by more people who need them. If you haven't pitched in yet, information on how to do that is available at stateofbelief.com. And you can find out more about the work of Interfaith Alliance and join us at interfaithalliance.org. And now to my first guest, Dr. Najiba Saeed is Executive Director of Interfaith at Augsburg University in Minnesota. She is also one of my favorite people to talk to about the vision of how religion can play a positive role in our national conversation and future. She's with us here today. I'm so excited to talk to you. Welcome, Najiba Saeed. Absolutely. And uh, just to clarify for today, I'm really speaking out of my own personal life and not from any particular professional background or position. I appreciate that. And so the news dropped this week. Um, We have full tickets and uh, both sides of the aisle, so to speak, or, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans. Religion is in the air and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Just from your from your own personal vantage point, like how are you understanding this moment and how religion maybe should or could play in the election that we're going to be all enduring for the next three months? I think that is such an important question. And, you know, um, I'm also South Asian. So um, one of the things that's very exciting is uh, on both ends of the aisle, there are South Asian women, um, whether it's um, the vice presidential pick for the Republicans, uh, J.D. Vance is married to a South Asian woman, or whether it's a South Asian woman uh, running for office, um, Kamala Harris. Um, And I think I think what's exciting about that is, you know, it takes us out of just the Abrahamic framing of religion. Right now. To, we get to hear about someone like Harris, who um, was raised uh, by parents who had different religious um, backgrounds, exposed to Hindu teachings because of her mother's Indian heritage and Christian teachings um, because of her, of her father's um, Caribbean and Black heritage. And I think it's really important for us to think about how religion is defined in, for instance, interfaith families too. Um, I think we're thinking a lot about what does it mean to identify people racially too in this race? Right. That's gonna come up a lot, right? Um, I'm the mother of children who are mixed race and they've come up with the name for themselves. They call themselves Wasians. <laughs> wow, <they're>, okay. <laughs> they're part, uh, you know, they're part white, part Asian American. And I share that because I think we're also going to think as we think about America as a multiracial democracy, it's also a multi-religious democracy. So I kind of thank you so to much. Put that out yeah. there too, no, it's right? so important. It's like one of the really exciting things, and I, I would, I agree. It's actually something that 
we can be excited about for both parties that there there is this happening and and uh and it does um you know it also sh- you know sheds light on the reality of american families many many american families uh, and the, you know coming from people have inroads into all different communities and we're not just one thing we actually are multiple things and so it's really it is it's exciting it really i think it's really exciting and that's why i kind of wanted to think generally and not just specifically about one one part of the ticket the other thing that's so exciting to me is Part of what the waltzes bring to this conversation is the story of Minnesota and, um, you know, one of the things and an interpretation of Christianity. They're both very deeply committed Christians, very much uh, engaged with their religious life, uh, very much um, excited, very much proud to be Christians in their um in their practice they come from and, and many- specifically Lutheran I mean it's very exactly. interesting you know like either. you know Christian isn't that you know is is also just Absolutely. it's a generic yeah. term but you can you in in Minnesota you go a little a little more specific sometimes and and there's a, a big tradition of Lutherans there Absolutely. which they and- are a part of and Waltz, um, Governor Waltz talked about neighborliness in one of the calls that he was on and how a lot of this notion of neighborliness. And I wanted to add, it's not just a Christian interpretation or a Lutheran interpretation of hospitality, but it's also a Minnesotan one. You know, we talk about Minnesota nice. And one of the things that's so powerful is, um, for instance, the history of how Christianity has been interpreted in Minnesota has led for many of the churches there to be very welcoming to many generations of immigrants. And I now teach at a university that is one of the most diverse, it's called the most regionally diverse campus in the Midwest. And that says a lot, that hospitality and openness. And I think this country, we're hungry for multiple iterations and emanations and embodiments of Christianity as well. So it's not just other faith traditions, but what are we going to learn from the Waltzes um, commitment to their Christian faith and their understanding of what helped produce a state that has one of the highest per capita or the highest per capita refugee and asylum seeker population in the United States, because for a small state, it's been incredibly welcoming. You know, um, I when I, I live in a neighborhood that's majority Somali immigrants, but that neighborhood a generation ago was also majority of another immigrant community. And I think this is really powerful uh, for us to begin to think about diversity, not just as an asset, but as a vision of America. I always tell my students, and I just talked to 500 students this past weekend, and I said, are we in each other's futures? Look at the person next to you. Are you building a future that has that person with you or doesn't? Mm. Mm. That is so big. And I just, I want to underscore, like, I had the chance, you by because you invited me to, to be a part of the Augsburg community. And I just want to take a moment because what Augsburg, who a, a traditionally and rooted in Lutheran tradition, but has welcomed so many other students and 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 just broadened its understanding of what it means to be a Lutheran, um, inspired by its Lutheranness. And I just think I I, don't, I know I'm like harping on the Lutheran, but it it is actually like I think it's deep, and I think it it's really like deep. Deep. and 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 I what I loved about it is the way you talked about it as a Muslim, like it's oh, it, when you, when when you hear a Muslim when you hear someone else talking about. A faith tradition say, yeah, like I love that about that. And the, the kind of the holy envy kind of thing that we talk about, like that's a great thing. And we can find that in all of our traditions, but it's not nothing that um you, you know, you've had friendships or, you know, associations with the walls and you've seen that play out. I just think it's an i I'm not sure that any walls anyone can talk about that better than you and i know you're in your personal capacity and absolutely and you know i think another exciting factor in this is minnesota has a very large native american population and we are looking at um a future of a governor who is native american 
And right. uh, I wanted to add that Governor, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan. And the reason I put that on the table is because the richness of discovery of how we uh, are able to build spaces that reflect where America is. And something that I like part of the most important part of this conversation is who gets to claim the heartland of America? Who gets yeah. to claim the Man. real America? And here we are saying, here's someone joining a ticket with a person who comes from a background that is, um, you know, that person identifies as both Indian and Black, herself is Christian in this moment and the choices she's made in her own life, a product of a Hindu and Christian union. And now we have someone joining the ticket that's bringing the reality of right in the middle of this country, you know, institutions that reflect um, such incredible diversity. And that I think is really the genius of this pick is that it's the waltzes themselves who who embody that inclusivity but it's also bringing to the table to say guess what we are the real america (laughs) you know a neighborhood in minnesota that is the largest somali muslim population outside of mogadishu next to one of the largest urban native american population in in the united states next to one of you know sunisa lee just won an Olympic medal. Guess what? She's from St. Paul and she's from one of the largest Hmong communities in the right. country. Right. After she won, she said something uh, that was so sweet. Uh, I heard one of her, they were asking her, what did she want to eat? And she goes, you know, I really, really miss pho. That's so Asian of me. And those <laughs> don't know the Hmong community, many are, some are Christian, some are shamanistic, some are a bit, are hybrid between the two. But now we have a shamanistic tradition on the table. You better go learn what that means because that's right. Minnesota. Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, immigrants a couple of generations ago from Sweden, from, uh, you know, from northern uh, Germany, you know, I mean, this is and then the Native Americans. I mean, I, I think, you know, and having gone to college out there and really felt like this, um, you know, this this commitment, I think it's really I think it, it you have uh, illuminated something that I'm sure I, I may become hopefully will become more illuminated in but what again like who gets to claim the heartland who gets to claim the heart of America and who gets to claim the vision for the future of America and I think that that the way you describe it is it was really perfect can you just just because we have you on can you say a little bit about the institute that you run and how like how how it is embodying all it of is, this effort it, it is embodying all of these efforts you know one of my favorite conversations um and this is kind of a typical conversation in minnesota uh one of the conversations was a jewish student who we took our students to um a local uh one of the local clinics that our partners on campus run and we had an imam and a outreach worker who are muslim particularly working with our east Africa. African Muslim community. I want to mention it's Somali and East African. We have a lot of Ethiopian Muslims as well. And one of the things was this incredible discussion where a Jewish student is talking to the imam about models of recovery. We have been very focused on the opioid crisis for the last year and a half. It's consumed us and it's become an interfaith effort. And um, so the student says to the imam, you know, I've been working on recovery models in my community, and sometimes it's difficult because they've been so Christian-oriented or Christian-centric, the 12-step programs. And the imam says, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, we've yeah. Had to, we've had to create our own um, models of, of, uh, of, of 12-step programs. And then I've had Buddhist students who've said, you know, that was one just conversation. And then Buddhist students in our classes who've also talked about recovery and using Buddhist mechanisms of contemplation and worship. So I think to me, when we begin to think about lived religion, lived experience, it is lived America. This is America um, alive in front of us. And I have been talking a lot. I just came back from the Interfaith America conference. I spoke to 500 students. And I was talking about, you know, we live in a moment of great turmoil, but we also live in a moment where the capacity 
for us to be chaplains for democracy is on the table. I loved and- that. I saw that phrase. I, 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 yeah, I saw that on, um, yeah, I don't know if it was social media or, or on a newsletter, but chaplains for democracy. I love that phrase. And that, in this case, that that can be anybody, like really caring, it can be anybody. And, caring, uh, you know, caring for the wellness, caring for the the you know, being listening is a chaplain idea. You know, I mean, all these the presence is a chaplain. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it's really I love I love that. And there can be excitement about these different choices that are being made. I also want to make sure that we think about the fact that after election day. Whomever wins, we need to come together for some kind of healing and conversation. And this chaplains, this kind of idea of chaplaincy for democracy is how do we listen? And instead of, you know, the election um, is one form of manifesting engagement in democracy. I really want to encourage people who may be frustrated when they are talking to folks that feel like they want to, you know, maybe not vote or not be a part of the democratic process. Let's not bully them. Let's not push them aside or operate from a place of fear, but let's listen. And it gives us the opportunity to move from a stance of not just exclusion, but also to a stance of problem solving, you know, like, Mm, are you willing to roll up your sleeves, come in? And if we, if you speak about democracy in a way that doesn't relate to everyday democracy, to everyday reality. You know, we really, I I think this is an opportunity and part of what chaplaincy and that model of chaplaincy is that it's show up. The table's here, it's set. Show up and we'll talk, you know? Because I want to make sure that we we don't just focus on, you know, um, just November. We have to Oh, no. as a country after November. And I really want to know what everyday democracy looks like to those that are listening. One of the really powerful moments in the past year was um, to have a project working with Minnesota Multi-Faith Network. And we were able to, um, the First Lady opened a statewide summit on hate crimes. And I just, you know, that was part of what we were able to host. And I just wanted to mention that because I think it brought people from so many different communities of so many different backgrounds. We had Jewish leaders, Muslim leaders, Native American leaders. We had a lot of people at the table that had no faith affiliation. And I think that kind of leadership, being able to bring people together across the table, we also had people drive out from rural Minnesota. And I, I, I wanted to to just mention that because they are diversifying rural parts of our country. Small towns are welcoming people of such levels of diversity. And so I think being able to have that capacity to recognize and show leadership as the Waltzes have done in so many ways that reflects rural, you know, rural uh, people living in small towns, people who identify as Christian in a very deep way, all the way to folks that are urban <laughs> dwellers and um, dealing with other concerns. You know, this was a unifying space, and I'm just so thankful for that leadership. And I think if we can think about that kind of leadership for the future, I I do see I do see in America where there is, uh, you know, I, I tell people where we. Where we're we're gonna sit down till everyone's fed and everyone's full. <laughs> oh wow! Thank you so much. This is uh, Dr. Najiba Saeed is the inaugural El Hebrew Endowed Chair and Executive Director of Interfaith at Augsburg University. Najiba, thank you so much for making time to be with us again on the State of Belief. I so appreciate it. Up next, journalist and author Rabbi Jay Michelson. You can hear full episodes of The State of Belief anytime on our website at stateofbelief.com. You'll also find links to topics we discussed this week, as well as transcripts and more. And make sure you subscribe at stateofbelief.com slash subscribe. You're listening to The State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet. Welcome back to the State of Belief. I'm Interfaith Alliance President Reverend Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch. 
Rabbi Dr. Jay Michelson is a writer, journalist, and meditation teacher. He is the author of 10 books, including his newest, The Secret That Is Not a Secret, 10 Heretical Tales. He's a contributor to CNN, Rolling Stone, and his Substack newsletter, Both and with Jay Michelson. Jay is a public fellow at the American Jewish University and the winner of the 2023 National Jewish Book Award for Scholarship. He holds a PhD from Hebrew University and a JD from Yale and a non-denominational rabbinic ordination. Jay, welcome back to The State of Belief. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. You have just put up a piece on um, the Forward website that says Josh Shapiro would have made a great vice president, but I'm relieved he's not running. And I have seen you like on social media and today, and um, and I just want to kind of you know dig into that with you on this historic week. Tell me more about why you felt like you had to write that piece and the emotion behind it. Sure, I mean I think a lot of American Jews were feeling really ambivalent about this possible candidacy. On the one hand, naturally, there's a lot of pride. Um, second, for me, I agree with with Governor Shapiro's politics. So, you know, I thought he'd be a great candidate. On the other hand, there's a lot of fear and dread. You know, I talked to one rabbi, a congregational rabbi, who was just worried that it would lead to a spike in anti-Semitic incidents, you know, that her own congregants might not be safe. Um, certainly, it would lead to a rise, a, a rise in anti-Semitic rhetoric, uh, including coming from Donald Trump, who I'm sure would quickly add Josh Shapiro to the list of bad Jews or crummy Jews or whatever adjective he wants to use, uh, you know, that he's talked about in the past. And also, you know, I'm, I'm not one who often calls out anti-Semitism on the left, but there has been a double standard applied to Josh Shapiro in the last uh, several days, um, alleging that he is somehow more uh, supportive of Israel than the other uh, potential candidates, whereas, in fact, the one who was chosen, uh, Governor Wallace, has a 100 percent rating from APEC. So, you know, it was just looking at three months of more arguing and contesting my identity in public. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, it's I I have to say from my own family, you know, I heard very similar sentiments that, you know, there was just a sense of, uh, you know, I mean, would c can we can we do this now, too? And, you know, <laughs> part, you know, part of me was was really excited by his candidacy. And I was excited. I'm excited by him uh, because I thought what he, you know, kind of dismantling Mastriano was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I, the way he's talked about um a uh, religiously pluralistic society and um, really has resonated with me. I respect that he's a religious person in his own, the way he wants to be religious. And, and, um, and so, and I, you know, I, I, I think he would have been a really strong candidate in other ways, but I also, you know, I think it's just really important to sit with um, for this for a moment and not kind of say, move on. And I mean, we're going to lots to say about Tim Walls. And, uh, you know, I, I think that this is a, this is a, a great can, um, person. I don't know him well, and I'm learning about him at just as everybody else is. But but I do think it's important for us not to just hop right over this, um, that, you know, there's a certain amount of, um, you know, bitter bitterness in, in the fact that we couldn't just have a Jewish vice president in this moment because of where we are in the world, but also as a nation. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I was struck when I was putting the, the forward piece together, the contrast to 24 years ago, right? When I just, I remember when Joe Lieberman's candidacy on the, on the ticket was announced, you know, there was maybe a little trepidation, but mostly it was just kind of celebration. And a lot of it was really, it just felt like more of a non-issue. Uh, yeah. than today. It certainly didn't feel fraught in the way that yeah. it does today. And, you know, that's disturbing to think about that. You know, we we, we like to think that the, the arc of history is bends toward justice, but certainly on this particular issue in the last couple of decades, there's been a real deterioration. And I do think, you know, I think my concerns on from the left side anyway are not I wouldn't be too concerned that that many people would be lost. You know, there was a lot of talk about that particularly, let's say, in Michigan, uh, you know, which has a large Muslim population, a large Arab-American population. But, you know, I think 
the reality, not the sort of hard left rhetoric, the reality uh, is that Josh Shapiro has built a lot of relationships with Muslim leaders. He has a really, uh, what I would think is a, a very nuanced and sensitive um, position on Israel-Palestine. So it's less a matter of the electoral cons uh, consequences in my in my personal case, and more just yeah, kind of exhaustion, you know, and we're yeah. just one other thing, you know, we're, 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 we're still not that far out from October 7th itself, right? We're dealing with the whole uh, intervening 10 months that have taken place. You know, the prime minister of Israel is acting in a way that the vast, the large majority of American Jews do not support. And Israel is most likely about to be under attack uh, from Iran right. in response right. to some of Netanyahu's aggressive politics and policies. So, we're already pretty tired, right? Yeah, it's already yeah. a very fraught moment, and to have this added on, you know, that's why it's that's why I'm breathing a sigh of relief. Yeah, and you know, I I'll just say like, well, one a piece of history which is kind of interesting is exactly 100 years ago. Um, I and I have you know I'm doing this uh, this book about my grandmother Elizabeth Brandeis who is Louis Brandeis's daughter. And I found this letter, the letter where uh, uh, my grandmother's mother, uh, Alice, wrote to EB and said, we had visitors from, and this was from the La Follette camp, who was a viable progressive. He was in, you know, he ran on the progressive ticket. He was a viable candidate. It wasn't like super, you know, it wasn't like the Green Party or something like that. He had ended uh -huh. up getting 24% of the vote. He visited uh, um that at that time, Justice Brandeis and said, "Would you be my VP on the ticket?" Mm. And, wow. uh, and it, which is like a pretty major thing at the time. Yeah. And, and, we, and <laughs> when we think of 1924, you know, the Ku Klux Klan at that time, and uh, there was a lot. I mean, what it would have meant, you know, for you know, for America to to have that kind of candidate, and also he was very, you know, considered a, a big progressive, but to have. Um, to have a Jewish candidate would have been amazing. He just said, "I think I can do more, more good on the court, and mm -hmm. and and not give up that position." But it's interesting these, you know, I as a, these moments, um, and I think we're in another moment. And I think, like as I say, it's not to just bleep over it and say, "Okay, this that was." A, I think Josh Shapiro is, you know, has a, obviously incredibly talented politician. We there and and youngish, youngish. I'm now everybody is beginning to be you know, <laughs> to me. You know, I mean it's really odd when you're starting to be like, oh yeah, they're young, you know, just because I'm getting old, not everybody below me, you know, <laughs> younger than me is young. But he still has a future here. But it was it was um I have to say I was I, I, I breathed I didn't breathe a sigh of relief because I didn't feel like personally that kind of the same, you know, um, but I'm I a lot I people in my life who are Jewish I had a very similar reaction and so I think what I wanted to just make sure that we we put an underline is that should not be the case right that any person from any faith background or no faith background I mean should be able to run and the people who share that identity should not feel that that position should put them in harm's way or that that should be um, the focus of attacks. You know, I mean, I think that, but this is this is the reality that um, your your piece so I think well on on the forward and the way you've been showing up on social media has really you know made plain. So it's a it's a, I would say a very I, I think it's I, I'm I, I'm learning more about Tim Walls. I think that you know it, there's there's a long election cycle in front of us. But I did want to make sure that we had a chance to to talk about this because they were the final two candidates, and it was yeah. I think Look, very I th I close. I think all of the final three were were strong candidates. Shapiro yeah. would have been fine. We would have dealt with all of these issues. I'm not. I don't feel like it was a a total bar to entry, um, and so I don't want to overstate it and let sort of the anti semites dictate this, these terms in a certain way. Uh -huh. um, That's important. We would have we would have faced these challenges, and we yeah. we would have prevailed. I think. Um, that being said. You know, there is just a lot on on the American Jewish plate. And as I said in the forward piece, facing those challenges means it's a distraction, right? This election is not going to be decided on like the anti-Semitism question, right? I mean, this is about pretty fundamental stuff. I mean, it is no coincidence, right, that Tim Wallace is the person who found the right word finally after all these years to describe Trump and Vance, right, which is the word weird. But that word actually carries a lot. It's not just they are weird. 
but it also says something about how I think profoundly un-American this kind of fringy nationalist proto-fascism really is, right? I mean, it's the weirdness, weirdness, right? But it's also, I think he's really put his finger on what really is at issue. Like, are these American values? Are right. these the people who are, you know, are in represent uh, the center, let alone the best of what America has to offer? Those are the issues that we want to be right. focused on. And so I'm sure we would have I don't want to suggest that, you know, we we're like we should be cowardly in the face of anti-Semitism. No, right. we would face them. But I think this puts the focus where it needs to be. And, and I'm enthusiastic. Great. Yeah, I, I, I'm just all of a sudden it flashed on me. Boy, is Austin going to be mad because remember, keep Austin weird. I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, well, you know. I've self-identified as a weirdo for a long I, time. I know. So that's I'm, I'm a little really reluctant. I'm not thrilled about I, this either, but I, 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 there's, <laughs> there's weird and weird. Reluctant. I don't want to impose yeah. my weirdness on the rest of the country. That's a fundamental difference, right? So live and let live. Be, you know, let your weird freak flag fly, yeah, but there just we don't, go. Uh, there don't we go. impose it on everyone else. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I did, you know, I did, you know, just recently, like pass a house that just had like 30 flags and you know all this like paraphernalia around trump and then and then mixed in with jesus saves and then like you know right you know, all this rhetoric and and i passed it and i was like wow that really is weird you know i mean like that you're like covering your house basically and it's not like this is not like i'm all for people having yard signs of any persuasion like that's like fundamental right of a democracy but to like just have it be like, it just, I think what was meant to be intimidating, now we can kind of look at and say, huh, is that really, is that but the that thing? But that is the right way too, to respond to a bully, right? You don't just call the bully the bully. That gives them a lot of power and say, you're being mean, you should be nicer. And no, I mean, we call them out for, you know, like what's behind that, you know, what's right. behind that bullying behavior is something really disturbing. I just, I remember since we're both old now, you know, remember when the, the Republican party was the party of the American flag and George Bush senior ran on the anti-flag burning amendment. Oh, yeah. You know, we were, we were very concerned about the American flag. And I remember as, as kind of a young adult at that point being like, Oh, those people they are so jingoistic. Now the, the American flag doesn't even work for these guys anymore. That's the weirdness, right? They have to have 30 different flags, you know, different, you know, stripes here and there, but also, you know, obviously the appeal to heaven flag and every other possible flag. And it's kind of like, well, geez, remember, I, you know, I feel like the most apple pie normie candidate on the, of the four <laughs> of them is now Tim Walls. Yeah, who, yeah, and, yeah know, exactly. I mean, I'm, bar. you know, I, I'm, I'm, from Wisconsin. I, we, I'm Wisconsin nice and he's Minnesota nice. And I, um, you know, and, and I, I, I think we're going to do the opportunities here are to learn more. And, and I think, you know, we had, we had EJ Dion on the show last week and, um, and he was kind of going through the different, um, candidates. And he said about, um, Tim Walls, he said, well, you know, they're going to say that he's a big, you know, big, big government liberal kind of stuff. And, and, and EJ Dion was like, yeah, well, you know, having actually kids get lunch at school isn't the worst thing, you know I mean? Like to actually, you know, feed <laughs> right. children and like have people have, ta right. you know, uh, tax relief, you know I mean? So it's you and I, because we're religion nerds, we like use a religion prism in some ways for the, um, for kind of the world and not just our own faith, but for um, people of uh, all different faiths. And, and, uh, uh, and so just curious, like now that we have a set, um, race uh, for the for the presidency uh, along with vice presidents what how do you understand kind of the religion element of the race like how can you how, how do you parse it I, I think you know i think there's a really interesting comparison if i, I can i'm going to stay with shapiro for one more second uh between because you know you mentioned paul that you know Josh Shapiro talks about his faith a lot, and it, it does inform his political positions. But nowhere will you find in his political program the desire to uh, impose his vision of faith or morality on the rest of the country. And you know, in my Substack newsletter, I took kind of a deep dive. I couldn't resist. I put all all of the JD Vance in one place uh, in that article, and really looking at this s seemingly strange, but it, it begins to un, you know make a little more sense on closer inspection. This this strange mixture of a certain kind of Christian nationalism on the one hand, with a sort of tech libertarianism on the other hand, right? So JD Vance has a number of mentors, one of whom is Peter Thiel, and you know there really is this notion 
in both of those that a mainstream American society has become kind of degenerate, both in the kind of trad cath or traditional Catholic theology uh, that Vance talks about. And he's not as he as he should be. He's quite open about that. It's not something that's a, a secret or a conspiracy, anything like that. He's given a number of speeches and written some articles where he's been very clear about how his faith informs his politics. And likewise, it seems very different. But again, there is this kind of a stream of authoritarianism in the sort of Peter Thiel adjacent tech world that also sees society as kind of going deeply awry. Um, and it's strange because they're so different, right, in certain ways, but they really have that in common. And that's the difference, right? I think from a traditional kind of Christian nationalist point of view, there's an understanding that, as Peter Thiel said, uh, freedom and democracy don't mix. You you can't, you, you have to have one or the other. It's not quite freedom, I don't think, in, in the Christian nationalist case, but let's call it morality and democracy. And that radical anti-democratic move, which we've also seen, I think, on the Supreme Court, that is what is so both weird and terrifying, right? It's strange. It's I think profoundly un-American, even as it says it's the essence of Americana. Uh, but with the levers of power, I mean, if this if 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 this is the governing regime, and also with the Supreme Court not acting as a check, uh, they really can impose a, an anti-democratic vision on this country in the name of religion. Wow. I mean, I I, I haven't really put those two together. Which, by the way, like to, if, for for. <laughs> Peter Thiel, and then to you know, with the kind of radical anti LGBTQ JD Vance, right, like right. that yeah. that that marriage is. I I thought I thought Peter Buttigieg did did a pretty good job at like kind of making that plane on Belmar. Did you see that clip where yeah, it's like yeah. you know, both basically wealthy men, you know. Uh, yeah, Although it's, it's it, funny, you know, I had a slightly, I have a slightly different take because I oh, was good. responding in that newsletter partly to the Buttigieg comments. So first uh-huh. of all, I don't want to minimize like he's def- it's definitely both and which is also the name of my newsletter right Buttigieg is clearly correct right these are wealthy men supporting the interests of wealthy men right so that's not you don't need a you know a PhD in religion but since you know we have PhDs in religion <laughs> it's worth using them also <laughs> let's go I think there is I think it's not just a marriage of convenience I think there is a shared anti-democratic vision uh-huh. uh, that they have a, and a shared sense that that our society has gone dangerously awry and non-democratic means are necessary to correct it. Fun fact, you know, I don't know if, if listeners are aware, but in, uh, in J.D. Vance's conversion story, a thing he mentions as an aside is I even thought I was gay for a while. Oh, so, yeah, no, definitely. I don't yeah. know. You know, that's not very well. I'm, I'm not trying to like out him or whatever, anything like that, of, of course, but just that that the, the, sexual that identity it made it into his memoir? was part of his yeah. journey. Right. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was part, and so I don't know what that means for him today, but certainly in his own writing, it was, yeah. it meant quite a lot to him in his twenties. And so finding this kind of so-called objective source of morality uh, that isn't dependent on me and my conscience, and and sees that my desires are something that has to be that have to be curbed uh, in a way that for society to operate. I mean, this is all very, I think, for you and I, very familiar territory uh, from looking at you know conservative, let's say right. hard, the, hard, the, hard right the, conservative. Yeah, religion. the, the boogeyman of a more rel- relativism and like how that has to be stamped out. Um, I, I I'm, I'm very curious. You know, it's interesting that he. I I'm not sure about his wife and whether or not she is converted or if she is a practicing Hindu, or I don't know what her background is. But yeah, I, I researched mean, it. it. She has not converted. He actually has a weird passage where he um in his in this one he wrote an article for a a, a Catholic uh, magazine a few years ago where he talked about his spiritual journey and it is it's. It's pretty interesting. I talk about it in my newsletter uh, at some length. Uh, he says he was actually he he they were uh, dating at the time, and he was reluctant to share this development, the spiritual evolution, with her because he felt it was unfair because she hadn't started dating a Catholic, and now he was no. he, had, he had this intention to convert. But he says she was very supportive. He does not say uh, and has not said elsewhere that she converted, but she's the great mystery right in in this whole you know she's such a compelling figure right i mean she's married now to somebody who says basically there should only be one parent one uh, one parent working you know so the other parent can stay home and raise the children meanwhile she's had a illustrious legal career on her own Correct. which she just Correct. she just uh uh quit to help him run for for vice president but 
you know, and then he said that kind of patronizing thing about her, patronizing slash maybe a little racist, you know, yes, she has dark skin, but I love her, which is a very bizarre thing to say. It kind of feels icky to even repeat it. Um, you know, this is somebody who's obviously yeah, extremely intelligent and capable. And I, I don't know if she's going to give an interview in 10 years where we'll find out what she's thinking in 2024. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, it, it'll, it, it is a, a little bit the, um, the mystery behind the spouses of the the Republican candidates is very is, is both of them uh, yeah. is very interesting. We're going to be introduced to you know the the kind of partners of the the Democratic um, candidates uh, in a more fulsome way in the coming coming weeks and months, and probably in um, in Chicago. Will I see you in Chicago? Are you coming to the DNC? Uh, it depends if someone's paying my way. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, yeah. All right. It, it is, uh, you know, I, I, I think we're in, in for, we're in for it. It's already started, but I just really appreciate you hopping on. And I just really want also like for um, any listeners who are kind of in this, you know, in this state, I, I, I hope I hope um, uh, the rabbi has given some voice to this and also some encouragement as we move forward. And as we show up for one another, listening to one another and learning from one another and just again, underscoring that no one should feel like, you know, that under extra threat in this moment. And um, so we're really thinking about the the Jewish community and um, and 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 the rest of America in in this moment where democracy itself feels under threat. Listen, uh, Jay, thank you so much for um, for hopping on to do uh, and in this really big week. So really appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Please be sure to subscribe to The State of Belief at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform or at stateofbelief.com slash subscribe. We need your help to keep making The State of Belief. Become a partner in this crucial work with a financial contribution today. Information on how to donate is available at stateofbelief.com. That's stateofbelief.com. And share what you're getting out of this show with people in your networks. Let's get more people listening and keep these conversations going on Facebook, Instagram, and threads at State of Belief. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of Religion News Service or Religion News Foundation. The State of Belief is produced by Ray Kirstein and is a production of Interfaith Alliance. Become a member today at interfaithalliance.org. And be sure to join us next week. I can't wait. Until then, I'm Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch on The State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet.